Pastor Scott and your team. Real life relationships. How do we relate in love with those that we disciple? We could also say real life relationships. How do we re relate in love with our spouse? How do we relate in love with our teammates? You could fill in the blank there any way that you want. And the, the truths that we're learning would apply to each one of those types of re relationships. I want to start this morning about by telling you the story that happened to a pastor that we're pretty familiar with here at Western Hills named Francis Chan. If you're not familiar with him, he was the founder and pastor of one of the fastest growing mega churches in Southern California. The name of the church was Cornerstone, uh, Cornerstone Church, and <clears throat> it was in uh, uh, Semi Valley, California. And at the time that this particular story took place, that mega church was drawing about 5,000 people every weekend, and it, they were just adding people every weekend in an incredible way when this story took place. And one of the young men that they added to the church in 2010 was a, a teenager. And this teenager was uh, a gang member. He belonged to a gang. And not in a positive way, as I was trying to use the word a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about Jeremy and his friends, but in a very negative way, a gang that was, uh, you know, on the wrong side of the law. And, but he got saved, and he got baptized, and he joined the church. But then after a few months, and we've seen this happen, certainly at Western Hills, all of a sudden, this young man stopped coming to church. And the way Francis Chan tells the story is this way. He says, one of my friends met with him and asked him, hey, how come you're not at Cornerstone anymore? And here's what the young man said. And I want to put it up there for you, if we have it. This is what he said. I didn't understand church. When I was baptized, I thought I was, and, and this is his language, by the way. This is not grammatically wrong. It's the way he said it. I thought that was going to be being jumped into the gang. Where it's like 24-7 they're my family because I didn't know it was just somewhere we attend on Sundays. The teen went on to tell this fellow he must have been wrong for expecting this from the church. And when Francis heard this, he told his friend that the kid had it right and that the church had it wrong. In fact, when he heard this, it made him sick, he said. In fact, I want to put that up right here. It says, that makes me so sick that the gangs are a better picture of family than the church of Jesus Christ. I can't live with that. We're going to do something different. Well, what he did eventually that was so different is he left that mega church. Because he didn't believe that he could do it differently and stay at the mega church. And plus there were some things that he needed to learn over the next few years that would be valuable to him. And he eventually planted a new church called We Are Church that's in the San Francisco area. But this was one of the primary things that motivated him to start that new church. We are going to do something different. Well, welcome to Western Hills. Because we're about doing something different. And one of the main things that we're about doing something different is what was missing in this young man's life when he joined that church. Getting connected in real life relationships with people in the local church. What is a real life relationship? Well, a real-life relationship is when you give someone the right to know everything about you and you give them the right to know everything 
about you. You know, and they give you the right to know everything about them is the way I should have said it. You give them the right to know everything about you, and they give you the right to know everything about them. We've drifted so far from this. This has been a common experience in my life as a pastor. I, this has happened numerous times in, you know, since I was been a senior pastor over the years. Someone would come to me from another church, a couple, and they would say to me, uh, would you do marriage counseling for us? And back then, I would agree to do it. I don't do that anymore, by the way. But back then, I would say, yes, I'll do marriage counseling. I'd sit down with them, and I'd ask them at the beginning of the marriage counseling, why haven't you gone to your church and to your pastor for marriage counseling? And they would say to me, we don't want anyone to know that we're having problems at our church. Now, what I do today is if someone comes to me for marriage counseling, I will say to them, I'll meet you with, with you one time, but if you want me to continue to counsel with you, then you have to do two things. One, you've got to attend here. And then secondly, you've got to get plugged in in one of our small groups and begin to get connected in real-life relationships with other people. Because I know that in the long run, that's the only way they're going to really grow spiritually in a way that's going to be healthy and help them in their own personal marriage. Now, we believe real-life relationships are the rails that the engine of effective discipleship travels on to reach the destination of spiritual maturity. Someone's going to really grow into Christ. We say it like this. It can't be church in rows. It needs to be church in circles because it's in circles that you can live out real-life relationships with one another in this series, we're learning from the life of Jesus what we need to do to form real-life relationships with others. In other words, we're holding up Jesus as the example of someone who knew how to do that. He's the model. He's the one that we're following. You're not following me. We're following him. And so we're really trying to look at the Gospels and how Jesus developed real-life relationships and go, what can we learn from the way Jesus did that? Now, last Sunday... We learn that Jesus had a real-life relationship with God the Father, and he had a real-life relationship with his disciples. Jesus did his part to have this relationship by giving them the right to know everything about him. And we talked about how transparent Jesus was with the Father. And then we also talked about how he lived a transparent life with his disciples. No, he never had a sin to confess, but he was very honest about his, the way he felt about things. Definitely what he believed about things, what he thought about things. He was, he was very, very honest with his disciple, transparent about his beliefs, his thoughts, his concerns, his feelings, and with his plans. Well, this week, I want us to focus on Something else that Jesus did to have a real-life relationship with God the Father and with his disciples. And this is it. This is what we're going to focus on. In those relationships, he was not only transparent, but he was very deliberate and intentional, focused on getting to know them. In other words, it wasn't a one-sided deal where Jesus was just being totally open and transparent with the Father and with the disciples. He was seeking to know them. And I want us to look at the life of Jesus and see how he went about that. What did Jesus do to really get to know God the Father? And what did Jesus do to really get to know his disciples? Well, let's start with God the Father. What did Jesus do to know God the Father? Now, Jesus was God. He was God in human flesh, a member of the Trinity. And so he knew the Father. In other words, in, in, to know the nature of the Father, all Jesus had to do was just look at himself because they were one and the same. But as a human being, he was also 100% human. Jesus had to 
relate to the Father in a way that we have to relate to the Father. And how did he go about doing that? In other words, it wasn't like when Jesus was 12 years old, he already knew every detail of his future. No, he had to relate as a human being to the Father in which he had to ask specific questions of the Father to know the Father's will, and he had to listen to the Father. Jesus went so far as to say that he only did what he saw the Father doing, and he only said what he heard the Father saying. And so he got this information. He knew the Father. He knew the will of the Father by spending time with the Father in prayer and in asking questions. So that's how he got to know God the Father. Well, what about his disciples? What did Jesus do to know his disciples? Well, once again, Jesus was God in human flesh. And the Bible says that Jesus knew all men and what was in their hearts, John 2, 24 and 25. And Jesus was given the gifts of the Holy Spirit without any limits, according to John chapter 3, verses 34 and 35. And so we see examples of this supernatural knowledge that Jesus had, where he knew his disciples without communicating with them. He, he, he knew the Holy Spirit. He knew the Father. And as a result... He had this supernatural knowledge of the disciples. For example, he knew what Nathaniel was thinking while he was under a fig tree before he ever met Nathaniel. Wow, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, he knew those, he knew what was in the heart of men. He knew when his disciples were having conflicts. He knew when they were having doubts. He knew when they were afraid. He knew Judas was going to betray him. He knew all his disciples were going to deny him. So Jesus knew these things about them because he was gifted by the Holy Spirit and he listened to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit revealed things to him about his disciples. Some people would call those kind, that kind of information words of knowledge or words of wisdom that he had. He didn't gain those things by communicating directly with his disciples. There were times where Jesus would withdraw from everyone and everything, and the purpose was to know the will of the Father and to listen to the Holy Spirit. Luke 5:16 says, "So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed." And yes, he was being open and transparent in his prayers about his own thoughts and his own feelings. But he was also asking questions and listening to the Holy Spirit and the will of the Father. In fact, it was after a time of prayer that he knew that he should choose these specific 12 guys to be his disciples. There was a multitude of people that were with him. But he went up on the mountain, withdrew into prayer in the wilderness, and he came down off the mountain and he chose 12 to be his disciples. Now this calling was the beginning of a relationship with his disciples in which Jesus was always listening to the Holy Spirit in order to know and understand his disciples. And as he prayed for them, he listened to the Holy Spirit to reveal things about them that he needed to know. But Jesus also knew his disciples by the way that he communicated with them. Jesus had many discussions with his disciples while they were just walking from one place to another. He had discussions with them when he would retreat with them to solitary places so that they could, they could just spend time together. He had discussions with them when he sat down to have meals with them. Have you ever just analyze the discussions that Jesus had with his disciples and what Jesus did in those discussions in order to get to know his disciples. You know what he did? Well, he did the same thing that he did with the Father. He asked questions and he listened to his disciples. 
Do you know that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are recorded 300 questions in the four Gospels that Jesus asked people? You know, the four Gospels are a lot alike, and so there's a lot of repetitive material in the four Gospels. But just think about it. I could read pr probably the Gospel of Matthew. If I just sit down and read it, I think I could probably read it in an hour. And just to think that within that gospel account, there's so many questions that Jesus asked. In fact, I've never counted them exactly, but one Bible teacher who did says there's 307 questions, if you want to know, that Jesus asked in the four gospels. Now, not all of these questions were directed to his 12 disciples, but they heard all of them asked, or we wouldn't have them recorded, right? They heard all of them asked. And what they witnessed, which is very important for us to learn, is how Jesus related to people. He asked questions in order to get to know them. Now, <laughs> you may not think that that's very astounding or you, you know, you may not think, wow, I came to church to hear that. But I want you to understand something about that. That is critical to real life relationships. Is that you understand that, yeah, the other person has to know you. And so you're going to have to be transparent for them to know you. But in order for you to get to know them, you're going to have to ask questions. Meaningful questions. And you're going to have to <clears throat> listen to what they say in order to really get to know them. Here's some of the questions that we know Jesus asked his disciples. Who do men say that I am? But who do you say that I am? There's two questions right there in that one story. Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? Do you also want to leave me? What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Can you not tarry with me one hour? Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Do you love me? You would think if you were God, you would not need to ask anyone any questions. Because he knew all men. He knew what was in their hearts. He could have told them what they were going to say before they said it. You would have think if you were God that you would have just set up a lecture hall somewhere and done all the talking. I mean, my goodness, you only have three and a half years to train these guys. So guys, you show up tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at my lecture hall, and I'm going to lecture you from 8 to 5. We'll take a break for lunch, go home and rest, come back the next day. You would think that would be the best way to educate the disciples, but that's not the way Jesus chose to uh, relate to his disciples. He chose to ask them questions and listen to their answers. Instead of doing all the talking, Jesus frequently started a discussion with his disciples by asking a meaningful question, or during the discussion, he would interject a meaningful question in the discussion. Now, I believe he did this to model for those disciples how they were supposed to relate to those they were going to disciple. In other words, if they never saw it done, how would they know they were supposed to do it? He knew they would need to ask those they discipled meaningful questions and listen if they were going to know them and have a real life relationship with him because they did not have the Holy Spirit without measure. And they were not God in human flesh who knew all men and knew what was in the hearts of men. When his disciples would answer these questions that Jesus asked, Jesus listened to more than just the words that they were saying. He listened to more than just the facts that were being shared. Jesus listened to identify the emotions or issues that laid behind the answers to those questions. You know, when I, when I first saw this in Jesus many, many years ago, it confronted two weaknesses in me that hindered me from knowing someone. 
and having a real life relationship with him. And here's the two problems I had. I wasn't any good at asking meaningful questions like Jesus was. I didn't even know where to start when I first saw this many years ago. Meaningful questions to get to know somebody. I had no idea what I should ask him. And then the other problem was that I wasn't a good listener. I had two strikes against me from the very beginning. For me, learning to ask good questions and being a good listener in order to have a real life relationship with someone has been a real challenge and it's been a very slow process. You know, our family life and the friends we have during our childhood has a great impact on how we relate to people. Do you know that? I mean, you can't, you can't avoid it. You're going to learn how to relate to people by how you were raised. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's going to happen in your life. It has happened in your life. So I came from a single-parent home, as you, most of you know, and the most significant person in my single-parent home was my father. And when it came to asking meaningful questions and being a good listener, I want you to know it was not a priority for him. I wonder how many of you would say that with both your parents or at least one of your parents, that when it came to them asking you meaningful questions and really listening to what you said, how many of you would say, you know, I either had one parent or maybe both of my parents, that really wasn't a priority to them. If that was true of you growing up, what, would you raise your hand? Is that true? I think that's probably true of the majority of people, especially those of us that are age 60 and over raised in our generation by parents who came out of that particular generation before ours, the Depression and World War II, I, it just wasn't a priority for my dad. <clears throat> we could sit at the dinner, dinner table at, at night in absolute silence. Remember, it's just me and him. I didn't have any siblings to relate to, right? And so we would have dinner together night after night and just sit there in absolute silence. We could sit in the living room watching TV shows and he would never say a word during the whole evening. When he had me work with him on some project, he might talk about how to do the project, but he never asked personal questions about me while we were doing the project. For example, he never asked questions like, well, Jerry, how is your day going today? That never happened one time. And he's the most significant person in my life. He never asked the question, you know, how are you feeling about your life? He never asked me, what do you like about that girl that you're dating? He never asked me, what are your fears about your future? He never asked me, what's, what's going on with your friends right now? Because your friends are important to you. He never asked me, how are you doing with your mother's death? We never had a discussion about that. How are you doing with your mother's death? He never asked about, Jerry, how do you feel about our relationship? Where we're at, you and I, father and son. How do you feel about that? Never asked that. He never asked, what is it like, Jerry, being my son? By the way, that's a great question to ask to your children. What's it like being my daughter? What's it like being my son? What's it like being my wife what's it like being my husband that's a great question to ask very meaningful question to ask well since he did not ask me meaningful questions i did not feel that he really wanted to get to know me now that may have not been true but that's the way i felt right when someone does not ask me meaningful questions i don't feel like they really want to know me in fact this caused me to question his love for me you know I have felt that same way in many other relationships since that happened. I mean, I am keen 
to the fact, if I'm in a relationship with someone and they never ask me any questions, I'm aware of it. That goes back to my childhood. Growing up, never being asked meaningful questions as when I was a child. And I can still tell you, when people do not ask me meaningful questions, I do not feel they really want to know me. In other words, I don't still don't feel loved when that doesn't happen. Well, I set out to change that when I learned this about Jesus. Because I could see I had a real deficit to make up. When it came to asking meaningful questions and being a good listener, that was not the way I was raised. <clears throat> And I wasn't aware that I really had a significant problem with this until what? Got married. You learn a lot when you get married about yourself if you're listening. Now, as a child, I was taught certain manners about communication. I was taught that I should not curse. You know, that's what I was taught. I was taught when I was with adults I should not speak until I was spoken to I, I was taught that I should not interrupt people especially the elderly people that were older than me especially adults I considered all adults to be elderly when I was a child right I was taught that I should listen with my eyes I was taught that I should listen with my eyes You know who taught me that? My coaches. Because you know what happened if you didn't listen with your eyes when you were in a huddle? It wasn't going to be good. And so I was taught, starting when I started playing organized ball, you know, when I was in the first grade, I started playing organized baseball. Coaches say something like, listen with your eyes. And a lot of times you'd end up running just because you weren't making eye contact with the coach as he was talking. So I learned to listen with my eyes. <clears throat> I was taught to take good notes when an authority is teaching me something. Don't sit there like a bump on a log and just... I mean, if somebody's in authority and they're teaching you something, take good notes. And I still do that to this day. When Brandon comes up here and preaches, I'm taking notes on what he's saying or whoever it is that's in this pulpit. Uh, you can watch me. I'll do it every time. And that came way back there. And what I learned, those are great communication skills. But I also learned that you can have those kind of communication skills and still not ask meaningful questions and not be a good listener. In other words, you can have those communication skills and it won't necessarily lead to real life relationships. So when I got married at 22, I thought I was pretty good at communication in a relationship. You know what? You can't learn much about relational skills if you think you're good at it. You've got to come to a place where you go, you know, I'm not very good at this before you can learn something. Well, after I got married, that false assumption did not last long. I discovered quickly that even though we were both human beings created in the image of God, there were some vast differences in the way that we were made. It's like we were from two different planets. We were both human beings, but I was from Mars and she was from Venus. And, and what happens as a result is because you're so different, male and female, it creates serious unexpected conflicts and all that poor communication does is magnify these conflicts it makes them bigger than they should ever be now I loved my wife but I did not have a clue about what to do until God spoke to me from first Peter 3 7 and that verse says this it says husbands likewise dwell with your wives with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Well, husbands likewise dwell with them in an understanding way. Well, I didn't know what that meant until I, I, I preached a sermon on this verse in a preaching class at seminary. 
And I discovered that one of the things that meant was I was supposed to study my wife in order to know her. Didn't mean I would always understand her. I was supposed to be understanding even when I didn't understand. But I was supposed to study her. That was news to me. I didn't know when I got married I was supposed to study my wife in order to get to know her. So God told me from that verse that was one of my jobs. And I shared it in my preaching class when I preached that sermon. I was going to study my wife. And I was studying her to know her better, to gain a better understanding of her as a woman. Now, what I knew from my educational experiences was that in order to understand anything, you had to ask the right questions. If you haven't got that one down yet, if you want to learn something, you better ask the right questions. But I had no idea what those questions were with a woman based upon where I came from. Had no idea. So this began this slow process of learning meaningful questions that I could ask her and others in order to know them and in order to understand them. Later, I became a pastor. And when I became a pastor, you know what one of my jobs is? It's knowing my sheep. Proverbs 27, 23 says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Well, in order to know them, I had to do the same thing. I had to study them. If I was going to study them, and this was especially true when they would come for counsel. Because normally when people come for counsel, what you hear first is not the real issues. And so you have to study them in order to know what the real issues are so you can help them. And so through being a pastor, I began this slow process of learning meaningful questions that I could ask people that I was shepherding. So here I am, I'm 64, and I'm still learning how to ask meaningful questions and how to listen in a way that enables me to know the people that I'm trying to disciple or to know my wife or to know someone else. Here's a few meaningful questions that I've learned that I can ask anyone in order to know them at a deeper level. I ask this one all the time. What is the most difficult challenge you're facing right now? Normally when I ask that question to people, they're going to give me something about themselves that will reveal something about what they're going through. It'll help me know them. A lot of times when I ask that question, though, what you're going to get is just the facts. They're going to tell you the circumstances that they've experienced. So the next question I've learned to ask is, how are you feeling about that challenge right now? I'm trying to get them to go deeper into what they feel about it. It's not just what's happened, but how do you feel about it? I'll ask the question, what is your greatest fear? And I'll ask the question, what do you want to see happen? Well, besides not being good at asking meaningful questions, I was also not a good listener. Do you consider yourself to be a good listener? How have you done so far in this message? Are you being a good listener? And when I got married, I discovered that I had some real bad listening habits that are not good habits if your aim is to really know someone. For example, I listened without focus, and I still do at times. I listened without focus. Now, what this meant, this meant that I'm, I'm present, I'm in the room, and I recognize that there's noise coming from you that is directed at me, but I don't even try to hear the content of the noise. Now, there's nothing wrong with this when you're listening to a one-year-old jabber at you and you give an occasional, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, to act like you're interested. But when you're dealing with someone else that you really should be listening to, it's not a good habit to have, listening without focus. Obviously, this type of listening is not respectful or helpful to the person doing the talking. They don't feel loved, and I'm not going to know and understand them if I'm listening without focus. Another bad habit that I had was I listened to the gist. 
I just listen to the gist. Maybe you're doing that with this sermon. I'm just trying to get the gist of this sermon. I listen to the gist. This, this type of listening meant that, see, I'm in a hurry. I've got other things to do. And so I am listening, but I'm just listening to the gist because I'm trying to resolve whatever you're wanting resolved as fast as I can. I'm trying to determine what you're saying and how it impacts me and whether I need to respond or not. So I'm just listening to the gist. And so as a result, what I'm doing is I'm only giving half of my attention to the person that's speaking. And I'm putting most of my focus on my own internal dialogue and how this impacts me. The person speaking can usually tell that my attention is elsewhere. And they're often left not feeling heard. They don't feel loved. And I'm not going to know and understand them using this approach to listening. And then... The one that was probably at, I, I practiced the most that was the worst, is I listened to respond. And this has been one of the hardest habits to break, listening to respond. I'm listening, but my aim is really to make myself known rather than know and understand you. I am usually waiting for you to pause for a moment so I can state my argument, so that I can give my opinion. So I can tell my story. My response often comes out quickly and somewhat enthusiastically showing others that I'm more focused on my own agenda than I am understanding and knowing them. I'm sending others the message when I listen to respond. I, I'm, I'm sending others the message that what I have to say is much more valuable than what you just said. It's usually obvious to the other person that they're not really being heard they don't feel loved, and I'm not going to know and understand them if I'm just using this approach to listening. Uh, I can especially use this approach to listen when I'm feeling compelled to fix someone. I'm just waiting to fix them. And I just want to get my point across as quickly as possible in order to fix them. I listen to respond. Now, any one of these three ways of listening may be okay in certain circumstances, I could give you an example of that. If you're working on a project with a bunch of people, there may be times where there's a lot of noise coming at you and, and you are not really listening to the content at all because you're focusing on this important project that's going on, that you're working on. And, and there may be times where, yeah, you've got an emergency going on and someone needs to talk to you for a moment and, and you just listen uh, in, in order to get the gist of what they're saying because, yes, there's an emergency. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to do this. I mean, it's critical. And certainly, there's times where it's okay to listen to respond. When you're managing a bunch of folks at one time, and uh, you need to respond in order to get things done on that project, then that's fine. But here's the deal, folks. Listen to me. Real-life discipleship doesn't happen that way. If you're treating people like projects, you're never going to be successful when it comes to real life discipleship. If I'm really gonna to get to know someone, I need to be like Jesus. I need to ask meaningful questions and listen to hear and understand them. Now in order to get this done, I've gotta overcome my greatest enemy. You know what my greatest enemy is? To over overcoming these bad listening habits and asking meaningful questions, I've got to overcome my greatest enemy, and that is self-focus. That's my greatest enemy, to asking meaningful questions and uh, being a good listener. Asking meaningful questions takes time. If I'm self-focused, I'm not going to give you the time. I'm not going to do it. Listening to someone to try to hear them and understand them takes time. And if I'm self-focused, I'm not going to give the time to that. You know, Jesus was a great example of this. In Philippians 2, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves about other people, that the other person... Is more important than me. 
have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So for Jesus, it was a greater priority to know others than it was for them to know him. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't it amazing that we've got a God that's that way? Yeah, he wants to make himself known. That changes us when we come to know him. But do you understand that God himself, Jesus, was the manifestation of who God is in human flesh? He's wanting to know you. You know what that should make you feel? It should make you feel loved. You know, it... it if I thought God was like my earthly father was when I was a child, I would think, God doesn't want to know me. And I would also not feel loved by him. But knowing that God is Jesus and God is like Jesus and the way he wanted to know his disciples and what he did to know them, asking meaningful questions and listening to their answers, that's who he is to me makes me feel loved it should make you feel loved he was always making knowing others the priority in any relationship now we're all broken by sin so we must overcome being self-focused in relationship in order to know others let me give you a few things here that we call them praises from the stage and it's not like you ever just grow out of being self-focused you mature so that your life becomes more characterized by being God-focused and other-focused than being self-focused. That's Christian growth in love. That's Christian growth through faith in God. But you know what? Here's some things that can make you aware that you're being self-focused in a relationship. Here's some obvious signs that I'm being self-focused. I don't ask meaningful questions that would help me know people and understand them. I don't. <laughs> That's a pretty good indication that I'm being self-focused. I'm not a good listener. When I start a conversation, I talk first about what I need in the conversation. I interrupt what people are saying so I can talk. I interrupt people when they're having a conversation with someone else. I tell people, when I'm being self-focused, I'll tell people the same thing over and over. When I'm being self-focused, I prejudge people. I jump to conclusions about them before I really know the facts and the circumstances. When I'm self-focused, I share those judgments with others that I shouldn't share it with. When I'm self-focused, I get annoyed with people when I do not feel they're listening to me. I don't stop what I'm doing to listen and understand people. I allow other people to interrupt a conversation because the other person is more important to me than the person that's been talking to me. When I feel I'm being personally attacked, I focus on how I'm offended rather than focusing on the needs of the person that offended me. And if I'm being self-focused, I just want to isolate myself from people. That's all the result of being self-focused. Now, I've got some good news and bad news about these bad habits. The bad news is there's not a quick fix to these bad habits. The good news is that God can change us through Jesus from living a self-focused life to a life that is focused on discipleship through real-life relationships. And you know the best place to grow and overcome being self-focused is to be connected to other believers that are sharing real-life relationships that want to share a real life relationship with you. That's the best place to grow and mature and overcome being self-focused. You know, we don't develop the fruit of the Spirit living in isolation. In Galatians 5, Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit-filled life. And he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Can you do any of those things in isolation? Or are they lived out in relationships with other people? Well, how can you be gentle unless you're in relationship with someone else? No, the fruits of the Spirit are things that grow up in our life as we are connected with other people in real life relationships. In, first, in 2 Peter, Peter said, 
But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And he gets, says these things, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. You see, you can't, you can't add these things to your faith without living in real life relationships with other people. Christian growth happens in community with other believers. Any change in the way that you relate to others always begins with a change in your personal relationship to God. We can't live isolated from him and change how we relate to other people. It won't happen. No, you can modify your behavior a little bit, but you cannot really have a change of heart being isolated from God. Only Jesus can change the human heart to love people the way he loves us. Will you receive Jesus? <laughs> you got this God that wants to know you. That's incredible. You're one person out of over six billion on the earth right now or more. And he wants to know you personally and intimately. He wants to walk with you. Isn't that incredible? That should make you feel loved by God. And he wants that so much to know you and to have a real life relationship with you that he was willing to make this incredible sacrifice that we cannot calculate the price that he paid in order so you could have that relationship with this God that wants to know you. Jesus. I just, I can't comprehend someone turning down that relationship. Why would you receive Jesus? Will you answer his call to make disciples through real life relationships? Will you learn from Jesus to be transparent? Will you learn from Jesus to really get to know people by asking them meaningful questions and really listening to their answers? You know what Jesus knew that we have learned is that he could not disciple people that he did not know. It's just impossible. How could he know what to say to them if he did not know them? How could he know how to encourage them if he did not know them? How could he know what they needed if he did not know them? He was intentional about knowing those he discipled and having a real life relationship with him because truly, truly, that's where love grows. Let's pray together. If you want to receive Jesus right now, just turn to him and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Save me. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He promises. If you'll put your faith and trust in him right now, just by saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner separated from you. And I need a relationship with you. Save me. Come into my life. He'll do it. Would you do that right now? And if you would do that, what you need to do next is you need to follow him in baptism. And in order to follow him in baptism, you can express that one of two ways. You can either put it on a connect card that you need to follow the Lord in baptism, or you can come to talk to me and tell me that, hey, I've received Jesus and I want to follow him in baptism. Thank you, Father, for this message and this time together. Thank you, Lord, for being a great example to us of how to have meaningful, real-life relationships with others. Thank you for teaching us what it really means to love, Lord, in the way that you related to your disciples. Lord, help us learn from you how to relate to one another and to those we disciple in a loving way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Brandon, and he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Well, you know, as I'm thinking about this message,